kick this meeting off for January 20th, 2020. Uh, agenda approval is the first thing we need to do. If everybody's reviewed the agenda, nobody wishes to add or change the agenda, I'd take a motion to approve it, please. Make a motion to approve the agenda as written. I'll second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Consent agenda items consist of the minutes of January 13th meeting and a liquor license for the Thai Smile restaurant in the Butler Street Pizza. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. All right. Any further discussion? All those who wish to approve say aye. 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 Public? Pretty absent in the room tonight, so I don't think we'll be using up any time for that. And uh, looks like we can jump right on to budget process. CIP first and then kind of go back. So CIP, highway, and then the parks. Um, <coughs> I didn't write a long memo uh, this weekend. Uh, Bill, are you on? No. Thank you. Thank you. So I didn't write a long memo this weekend, but um, I did write a quick email. And if you read it, what I indicated was, as I did the uh, operating fund budgets, I was able to come to a tax rate of uh, 51 cents, which is the same tax rate that we had last year. Uh, it's 51 cents almost exactly if we get a 1% increase in the grand list, and it's you know, just marginally higher than that if the grand list doesn't move at all. Uh, and I, I thought that when I started the process that I would be able to do that with the general funds if I ignored the capital fund, except for the fact that I tried to increase the money that we were sending to the CIPs. So um, when we get to the, uh, we've already talked about the fire budget, but the highway budget, uh, the recreation budget, tried to increase the, uh, the transfer to the CIPs by in the 3 to 4 percent range. Inflation is running a little bit more than 2 percent for the last 12 months ending December. So, um, you know, I was pretty happy with that, but I was concerned what I was going to see when I got into the CIP funds. Um, as you know, we've done quite a bit of buying in the last uh, several months, and you've indicated that you would like to do more as far as paving and the like is concerned. And uh, when, I, when I first kind of ran, ran the numbers, I was a little disappointed, and then I started thinking about it, and I said, well, I shouldn't be surprised at this. Um, you know, although we've been trying to incrementally add to the transfer into the CIPs, if you think about the highway fund alone, I think we, we budgeted about a uh, $533,000 transfer last year from the, CI, from the highway fund into the three highway related CIP funds. And we spent a half a million dollars for paving, just about. So that leaves $33,000 for the rest. And, and that kind of uh, situation has been going on for a while. So let's just look at the CIP budgets. Um, and you don't have what I have in front of me, except what I have in front of me just has some notes on it to myself. So starting in Fund 70, um, you can see at the top in the revenues, I've uh, budgeted for a 3.43% increase in the transfer from the from the highway fund from 288 to 297,865. And then the pilot payment, um, 
the 82,000 was really lower last year, I mean higher last year when we looked at it, but we sent $16,000 to the REC CIP because that was kind of underwater. But from 82 to 100, that's a, you know, a 20% increase, but that's kind of on a low, a low dollar amount. But anyway, those revenues together are about 7.5% higher than it was last year going into the paving CIP. Um, and then for the expenditures, we've got the half a million dollars, which is mainly set for um, Maple Street and maybe if we can Howard Avenue, and then to pay 57, I mean, uh, $57,000 worth of uh, debt service on the Perry Hill bond. So, you know, that fund at the end of 2020 will be underwater by about $382,000. As I've said before, um, we've got funds 70 through 75, and some of them are, look like they're in big deficit positions, others look like they're in fairly significant surplus positions, and they all round out to, at the, at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of uh, 19, uh, if the budget came out to be exactly as we planned, we'd have about $30,000 in the CIP funds altogether. So if you think of it that way, $30,000 to start the year in the CIP funds, and in the paving, I mean, in the highway fund, we're putting 550, I think, 548,000 into the CIP funds, and then we're spending a lot more money. So um, you can see why we are where we are. Moving down to Fund 71, um, you can see in red there, uh, over in the 2019 actual column, there's a state grant number there and it says $100,000. There was $76,500 budgeted. The $76,500 budgeted was 75% uh, of a uh, project to do a culvert on Perry Hill, uh, which was uh, 60, uh, no, that would have been uh, 50 something thousand dollars was the grant, and then a $24,000 grant uh, to do some work over on Little River Road. The Little River project cost significantly less than we had estimated, so the grant on that is about 13,300. And then um, I think we'll get at least $100,000 from the Perry Hill project. Um, that project ended up costing significantly more than we budgeted. We knew it would. We had an estimate from the year before, <laughs> but FEMA kept saying, well, this is about an $80,000 job. And we said, well, let us bid it, and then we'll redo the numbers. And when we bid it, it was $150,000. I was going to say, I thought it was one hundred fifty. dollars yeah. So um, I, I'm thinking there that when it's all sugared out, that we'll have a grant of at least $113,350, maybe a little bit more than that. But for, for right now, I used $100,000 as an actual number for 2019. Knowing it would be low, I wanted to uh, underestimate for the purposes of making the tax rate look as bad as it possibly could look. In 2020, uh, the red zero there for the state grant is, um, again, a, cons a conservative number. We will apply for a structures grant to try to do a project on the bridge at Dr. Murray's on Guptill Road. Uh, if we get the grant, uh, the grant will be about $136,000. But as I've indicated in the past, given the state's spending in Waterbury with the Main Street project at uh, you know, 2 percent share of what's going on there for the locals, I'm skeptical that they're going to give us a structures grant. So I didn't budget for it. If we get it, it's a little bit of gravy. So if you move down, the Main Street project. Excuse me, Bill. Yeah. That, that, that'll be two years in a row that that's, we've slid on that bridge. 
I didn't well, say that we weren't doing the bridge. Oh, I said, okay. I'm, no, I'm not counting on. But the we grant. didn't get the grant last year, and you're um, thinking. I haven't grant. got to the expenses yet, Chris. Oh, I apologize. So no, no, it's fine. The, so the zero up there on the state grant is, I'm not anticipating getting the grant. We're going to apply for it. <coughs> but yeah, if I we move it. down the page now, yep, sure. you see the transfer from the highway fund. Last year was 155,000. This year it's 158,875. So it's two and a half percent increase on this one. And then moving down to the expenditures, uh, the downtown project. We budgeted 100 this past year. Uh, turns out the town's share is going to be about 159,800. Um, you know, it's just an estimate. There's no way that you know how much progress they're going to make <coughs> until they make their progress and you get a bill for 2% of what they've done. Um, and frankly, um, Jay McDonald worked longer than I thought they were going to work. They worked right up until, you know, almost Christmas. Uh, so our share was 159,853. And that's a that's a, a net cost there for us. Um, the the two percent share that the local community paid was about two hundred and twenty two thousand, and the difference between two twenty two and one fifty nine or one sixty almost is what the water and sewer paid. And so what we do is the town pays the bill, and then the water and sewer reimburses. So one fifty nine eight fifty three last year. I've got 190 budgeted for this year. Um, McDonald is pushing hard. They want to try to finish. I don't think they'll finish. Um, but I've got 190 here right now uh, for 2020. The sidewalk repair is in red. Um, so, Bill, am I reading there? I see 130. Yeah, I was, was going to yeah, say where. Okay, where so I told you, you have a different one than I yeah. have. I've got yeah. that one here. So 130 is what I had uh, yesterday, but after getting the final bill and everything else and working things out, uh, I'm thinking 190 is probably going to be a truer number. Did one, you, is that in a, just in a different email, or is that just not? I didn't email. Okay. It's, okay. it's just here, and I didn't make a photocopy of it because I knew you would all have what we have from yesterday. Is that 190 even? Yeah, that's what it's budgeted for. <coughs> Into the mics, please. Sorry. So $38,000 for the sidewalk uh, replacement. And uh, the state, <laughs> uh, the state is scheduled to uh, repave the roundabout project this year. So the, the mm -hmm. roundabout up to the uh, limits of that project down um, Route 2 toward Butler Street, um, this way a little bit and up the ramp a little bit and the roundabout. That's a state job. They're going to do that this year, I guess. Um, and when they met with us, uh, they talked about whether or not we wanted to include any work along the road there. So uh, we've got $38,000 in the budget for sidewalks. Um, we asked the state to include in their project, in their bid, to replace the sidewalk that runs basically from Maxie's. I think it's from Maxie's that way. It may be a little further, but part of the sidewalk on the east side of, um, or the north side of North Main Street there. Union Street side, are you thinking? Yeah, the Butler Street side. Oh, okay, so you're down past, uh, past Maxie's, down past the old yeah, Valley that, Rental. that end there. Okay. Um, so we've asked them to include that in their, in their uh, cost, mm -hmm. hoping that it would be cheaper than we can do, but I don't think it's going to be. Um, so the other day when I met with Celia and Woody, what we said was we'll ask the state for a price on that. If it's a good price and their contractors can do it, we'll have them do it. If it's a $50,000 cost, we won't do it. Um, 
and we'll do the other side of Winooski Street this year. Last year we did, or two years ago I think it was, we did this side of Winooski Street. And if we, the plan was to do $38,000 on, on the, that side of Winooski Street this year. But I've got it in red on my spreadsheet here because <clears throat> there's a lot of spending here and we haven't talked about the tax rate. So if I had to, as much as I hate to, I, if we had to cut the $38,000 for sidewalk would be, would be cut. The next line down, Chris, is the 170,000 for the bridge at Murray's. And um, so my plan right now, <clears throat> and uh, So you don't have to read this whole thing now, but bridge number four is the one that we're talking about now. Uh, Alec has, has put together this uh, memo, if you will, that lists many of the bridge needs. And uh, bridge number four is the one that we're talking about. And um, you can read that later, but uh, it ranged from uh, about 143 to 170. I'd like to try to do the $170,000 project, which is to uh, get the six inches of pavement off the bridge and then pave back from the approaches of the bridge and then put only three inches of pavement on, back on the bridge. Um, it would be cheaper if we left six inches of pavement on the bridge and then um, had to, you know, kind of, um, Build to that, but that leaves 36,000 ton. I mean, 36. How many tons he says on here? 36 tons of uh, dead weight on the bridge that really doesn't need to be there. So, I, I if we're going to do that, I would prefer to do the whole project and get the bridge back to the way it should be. Um, Austin. Uh, gave us that price last year, <clears throat> and uh, he just he ran out of time. He didn't get to it, so um, we didn't cancel that project. It was just that he, he didn't get here to do it. So <clears throat> that's in there for now. If you move down from the 170, you see $46,000 in building improvements. Um, we had to buy a new lift for the highway garage that's already been purchased. That was $10,000. Um, the old lift didn't pass uh, its safety inspection, so uh, we got the new lift already. The roof on that building should be replaced. It's $36,000 to replace the roof. Um, Burrell has a warranty ran out a few years ago. Burrell's done a good job of kind of patching it and maintaining it, but it really should be replaced. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, we can, we can move the spending around. We could put it in the highway budget if you want, but either way, it's, it's $36,000 of spending that um, I wasn't it wasn't that I wasn't expecting it, it's just that I'd forgotten that you know, the highway garage is now 22 years old and the roof is ready to be replaced. I mean, we paid the bond off two years ago and uh, you know, so it's right on target, you know. It's right where it's supposed to be. <laughs> and then down below that is debt for the uh, interdepartmental inter or interfund borrowing that we've been doing. If you turn over the page, <coughs> highway vehicles, um, the sale of assets at the top of the page is 
We've, we've got a. Oh, I'll get there. I'll come back to that. So, uh, ninety-two thousand two hundred and fifty dollars is the proposed transfer into this CIP. That's two and a half percent higher than last year. Excuse me, Bill. Where are we? I was the doing. Top it. of uh, fund seventy-two. You're on the right. It's on your left hand, right? Right. It's, yep. Right there at the top of the page. Okay, I got fund 73 is top of the page. Oh, yeah. Huh? huh? Oh, I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay, so fund 72, 92,250 is the proposed transfer. Uh, $4,000 from the Parks Department. They send $4,000 a year, and we use that to buy lawnmowers and things that they pay their share of. Um, the loan proceeds, one sixteen eight hundred. That is, uh, we were authorized to borrow one hundred and twenty-five thousand for the um, the uh, roadside Tractor. mower, yeah. and the cost is going to be one sixteen eight. And then, so uh, moving down, you see the cost of the roadside mower there, 116880 um, Tandem truck is scheduled to be purchased this year. Um, the, was it two, it's a 2013, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's a 2014 uh, Tandem. And back when we put this schedule together, back in 2014, the cost of those vehicles was $155,000 before any kind of trade-in. Um, now it's significantly higher. Um, it's the truck itself is. Uh, the truck and the body all together is 205,341. Uh, will give us $57,500 for the for the old vehicle. So it's a $147,000 cost. I got 148 there. It's 147,841. So <clears throat> we have put the order in. Uh, Clark's. Gave to them. Uh, Clarks will order the chassis uh, upon receipt of this signed order, with the understanding that if the town meeting the truck purchased is turned down, the town of Waterbury may cancel the order without penalty. So, just like the fire trucks, if you wait until town meeting or 30 days after when we get the authority and then you put the order in, you're not going to get the truck until a year from now. So. Uh, we're hoping to have this vehicle available to us late this year. Uh, if for some reason we, we can't get this through the budget, then uh, the order will be canceled. So excuse me uh, for interrupting, but 205, is that with plow and everything? Yeah, that's, okay. that's the whole, the whole okay. nine yards. All the, the vehicle price is 129000 in the body and Associated equipment is seventy-six thousand four hundred, for a total of two hundred five three forty-one. So that's the large plow truck. Yeah, the six-wheel trucks. So our expectation on those is about a five-year use. That that's uh, six. Yeah, that's a ten-week. Six years, <coughs> almost seven. So two thousand fourteen and two thousand twenty. It's two thousand twenty now. So that's six. We may have bought it in 13. I, I, I didn't look back to see when we actually bought it. It's a 2014 vehicle. Um, and then the one ton truck, uh, the 2014 one ton is also scheduled to go. <clears throat> That's $87,000. Uh, we have a one ton that we kept and the two iterations ago, and that's used by the summer folks who do the mowing of the 
you know, the ball fields and the cemeteries and stuff like that. So we've got one vehicle that's probably like a 2008 that um, will take the body off of that. We'll probably just, and we'll put that body on this 2014 because the 2008 has a better body than the 2014. Um, and we'll keep the 2014 to use in the cemeteries and parks, buy a new one ton, and then we'll, in the end, just sell the chassis of that old 2008 vehicle. And I have no idea what that's going to bring in. So that's what the $2,500 is up there at the, at the top as a sale of assets. <clears throat> so that takes care of <clears throat> highway vehicles. You go on to your next page, which is Fund 73. That's the uh, fire vehicles. We know the damages there from what we, uh, what we did in the fall. Uh, so the transfer of 173,390 is 4% higher than um, what it was last year. There's the borrowing if we need it. All of it. And then coming down uh, in 2019, we already spent the 461,395. We haven't borrowed for that yet. So when you get to the end of that uh, fund balance in the actual 2019 column, this fund has $24,467 in it right now, even after that purchase of that fire truck. But if we buy another truck for 489,645, which we've already um, signed a contract to do, and pay the debt service of um, sixty-seven thousand um, dollars, we'll end that with a significant deficit unless we borrow. So I've got the full borrowing in there, and that fund will be five hundred ninety-one thousand seven dollars at the end of the year if we if we borrow the whole amount. Oh. And then moving down into the uh, 75, Fund 75 for the parks, this is where we had that Volrec grant last year that we didn't get. Uh, we ended up spending a lot of money on the lights on this field, but had to be done because of the code issues um, when we got into it. So the transfer of uh, money from the general fund here is up by 10%, 33,000 from 30,000, uh, so total revenue of 33,500. And then um, you have just a yellow mark on your page with no number in it, right? Mm -hmm. So the number that's in that yellow mark right now is $11,000. And that uh, is for the roof of the pool building. I think you've seen that, that haven't you? Mm -hmm. um, so the pool building really needs a roof as well. Now the pool, you know, we use it eight weeks a year, and it's a pool building, and people go there to get wet. But when it rains, it leaks. Um, and it really should be replaced uh, when the wind blows hard. You know, the shingles are coming off that building right now. Uh, so we should replace that roof. Um, and then the $5,000 for the Armory Park up behind the school, that land that we transferred this recreation easement on up there um, for outdoor recreation, um, we indicated that we were going to develop that into a, a little bit of a park. Uh, the school uses it quite a bit. They've got some trails out there and some um, you know, climbing stations and the like. And the $5,000 is to do some thinning of trees in there. We took some trees out this fall. That was what the $1,400 was. Uh, there's some more that needs to be done. This is something that um, Dan Sweet went up, looked at what needed to be done, put together a plan, and uh, gave it to a local guy from Duxbury. I can't remember his name right off the top of my head. Uh, 
head, but um, Potter. it was about a $6,500 project or so, and uh, I'm hoping it won't actually cost quite the five, but that's what that 5,000 is. Um, we don't absolutely have to do it, but it would be a good thing to get that job done. And just put it to bed and be done with it. So, if you go all the way down to the bottom of your page, you see that um, you have an ending fund balance of negative uh, 248,151. <clears throat> things that I added into mine over here that you don't have on your list is uh, right now is 318.406. I wrote in my email to you last night that we need to raise between three and four cents on the tax rate in order to um, get this budget to balance. So the operating funds Kept that as a 51 cent tax rate. The CIP, to do what we just described, is going to take between three and four cents. Now, if we get some additional revenue that I wasn't planning on, uh, if we get the uh, structures grant, which I'm really not planning on, and most of the things in the uh, infrastructure th side of things. I believe they're high estimates. The vehicle prices are pretty accurate. They're, it's going to cost us, you know, 489645 for the fire truck, and it's going to cost um, whatever I told you for, 148. The, for, the, for the table. Those prices are really firm numbers. But even, you know, the paving and the bridges and the like, um, you know, they can go either way. They're not, they're not hard, fast numbers until they're done. So um, that's where we are. I'll stop and let you ask questions. Um, as always, there's way more to do than we have money for. Uh, we're making inroads, I think, on, on the paving. Uh, we've got a long way to go. You've indicated that you'd like to spend half a million dollars on paving. You know, Alex's uh, report there on, on structures and bridges, uh, before I get to the end of this exercise last night or yesterday morning, the bridges, instead of 170, I had uh, 235 in it. And the 235 was, uh, I was hoping that we could do this $170,000 worth of work and then pay for the design I guess it was 237, pay for the design of this bridge over here on Main Street that we talked about a couple of years ago, um, and have Stantec get that bridge designed, and then it can just sit on the shelf, and if it takes three years or five years before you can do it, you can just redo the numbers and it's ready to go, or if there's a grant, you can you know dust it off quick. But um, I can't. I took it out because I think we're pushing the envelope right now for what your comfort level is. So with that, I'll stop and you can ask some questions and we'll go from there. So the, the main reason why we end up with such a negative CIP fund balance in 2019 is that fire truck, right? At least that's the, one of the major contributors. Well, it's... It's kind of cumulative. Um, we didn't expect, yeah, we, we thought we were going to be buying two fire trucks this year. We ended up buying one last year. I think part of the reason, Mark, and it goes back to what I said at the very beginning of the conversation tonight, is that when you look at the highway fund, um, the transfer from the highway fund uh, into the CIP funds is in the half a million dollar range for three CIPs, paving, structures, and vehicles. So we're transferring a half a million dollars and we're doing a half a million dollars worth of work just in the paving fund. And we never, you know, the half a million dollars that we've moved up to in the past couple of years, we didn't really 
jack up the transfer into the, you know, we were transferring somewhere in the, you know, high $400,000 range, and we were paving in the 325 range or 275 range. And we bumped that up to the $500,000 range the last couple of years, and we added 50 or 75,000. So we, we increased the spending by a couple hundred thousand dollars, and we increased the transfer by 50 or 75,000 dollars. So it's kind of a cumulative effect. I think what, what it tells me when you look at, you know, here's the list out to 2037 for highway vehicle replacement. I got another list in here for fire department equipment replacement that goes out to, you know, 2031. Um, and then we've got paving and structures and, uh, you know, we're going to, I didn't add up all of it, but um, the... Uh, yeah, because you, you should be able to build basically a schedule of depreciating assets and then basically estimating timing on replacement and future, I don't know, estimate growth in costs and then start to figure out what each year we should be at least putting aside for. Yeah, that's the easy right, part. Right. It's, it's it, easy the enough to do that. It's hard to put the minus. The, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. I was just going to say that the, the difficult part is our, the costs of all this equipment is growing at a faster rate than we have the ability to raise the revenue to, to replace it with. And, and, and when we started this, <coughs> when we started the CIP fund a number of years ago, oh. um, it was never the expectation that we were going to be able to put enough money aside that we could just pay cash for things. There was always the expectation that it was going to be a combination of putting money aside and borrowing. Um, yeah, I guess that's my first thought on just anything like Maple Street or Perry Hill is that it seems like a project like that, it makes sense to borrow to amortize that cost over something that's so big because if we just do that project, there's so many of the smaller stuff that we're just going to put off, which right. concerns me. No matter how you cut it, you're, you're backing yourself into a corner. You're only going to be able to leverage yourself with the issues that we have in front of us. You're only going to be able to leverage yourself out a couple of years before that leveraging becomes one big nut. And you're not, you're not going to, no matter how you do it, you're not going to. We'll say a $500,000 <clears throat> spend that you amortize over 10 years and you spend 55000 or 60000 per year instead of 500 in one year. But when you start to overlap those. Sure. Same, <laughs> that's when you get into trouble to the point where you're, now you're in and, and again I'm always looking out further than probably I should but um, you'll get into a situation where you're you potentially could be borrowed out you know well yeah I mean I understand that you have to be careful that you can't borrow for everything but I think the larger projects it just makes sense because I think the only reason that maybe we're under this pressure, at least under the paving, is that we're trying to do a pretty large project without borrowing. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know if you recall the discussion that I had with the townspeople back a few years ago where I said, suggested that in order to really keep up with our paving problems, we needed close to a million four every year. And we're, we're less than half of that now. Uh, and to, to, you know, to suggest that we need, that we could put in a million four, I knew it was an impossibility. But the reality of it was, in order to keep up with, with that uh, a reasonable cycle, and again, it goes back to leveraging out your, your, your boring ability on paved roads when, you know, like I said, equipment's one thing, Paved roads is another thing. You you can get 20 years out of a piece of equipment. In a lot of cases, you can't get 
boy, you're, you're lucky to get 10 years out of a, a paved road. Uh, in fact, I spoke with a resident up on Neyland Flats the other day, um, the same gentleman that we did the styrofoam spray, spray foam driveway for. You remember that, Bill? And he started talking about Neyland Flats, and he said, I remember everything you said at town meeting a few years back, and he said, Neyland Flats is on its way down, you know, downhill big time right now. And, uh, and I said, we've already had that discussion. I've already suggested that this is the perfect scenario for uh, overlay, but unfortunately, because of the rest of the bad roads that we have, by the time we get to this, unless we choose to slide that one in there somewhere, amongst trying to deal with these other really degraded ones, uh, by the time we get to that, we're going to be in the same boat that we are with Maple Street and Barnes Hill and, you know, Gile, uh, Guptal Road. Uh, well, I think we're I think we're going in the right direction. We are the last, absolutely the last absolutely. Few years. There's no question. And, you know, there's there's no quick fix. Uh, we're we're moving in the right direction. So, just just to you know, I added up quickly here. Uh, you know, in the fire department, we're putting one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars aside. In the rec department, we're putting thirty-seven thousand dollars. And in the in the uh, um, Highway department, it's 549000 So we're putting $761,000 into the CIP right now. And, you know, five-eighths of it is going to be spent on Maple Street. And, and then, you know, the, the rest is for, is, is going to be all sucked up by the, the rest of the, the projects. So as I indicated before, we can, we can borrow um, between borrowing from the bank and borrowing from ourselves. You know, I, I was working on the tax stabilization uh, report that I have to do annually. And I think I mentioned this before, but as recently as 2017, we, we owed from the CIP funds to the tax stabilization fund about $860,000. Now we're at Six hundred and sixty-seven thousand dollars. So we've got about one hundred eighty-three thousand dollars worth of capacity just to, you know, borrow from ourselves again, and we we can do that. I don't think we're going to be able to borrow everything that we need from ourselves, but I think it should be maybe a combination of some additional borrowing. But I'm not sure that I feel comfortable just saying let's keep a fifty-one thousand a fifty-one dollar. 51 cent tax rate and don't do anything else because if we do that it's just gonna it's gonna snowball uh, yeah, I guess that's a good term for it. Yep. So, so I think we I think we you know need to uh, do a little bit of, of both and I don't necessarily think we have to go out and get it doesn't hurt to get authority from the voters to borrow from ourselves. Uh, when the accountant does it, uh, and you look at the audit report, the money that we've borrowed from the uh, tax stabilization funds, um, they, it just is called an advance of funds. It's an advance from the, the tax stabilization, and a, an advance to the tax on the balance sheet, it's from the tax stabilization, it's an advance to, and on the CIPs, it's an advance from, and it just puts our money in the right basket so that, um, you know, it earns the proper interest on whatever we have in the checking account. And we choose to pay ourselves 4% right now, and we did that because it's, it's, in, it's in lieu of uh, uh, fixed income securities that we can't get. So I, I think we should continue to pay ourselves back at a uh, higher than market rate just because it, it puts some more money back in, into our coffers. But if you wanted to lower the interest rate, you could. But I think that we, you know, we got to get a couple more cents than 51. I don't know if we have to go to 55, but maybe 53. 
We can we step back a little bit and just talk about um, let's just specifically talk about paving. So if if we never borrowed and we said every year we're going to spend, I'm just going to use a number half a million dollars. Yep. And every year we just plan on spending half a million dollars, half a million dollars. But if we borrow for a half a million dollar project and say say just for argument's sake, it's fifty thousand dollars. Doesn't it make sense then that because of that debt? an interest line because you've amortized that project over multiple that when you then put 500 not 450 in because basically you've taken one project and you put it over multiple years but we're actually we're not doing half a million dollars in paving we're really doing you got to take in the Perry Hill debt as included in this year's budget as paving even though the project's been done we're paying for that. Yeah, we're paying for right, so we're really not doing half a million dollars in paving. We've done 557,000, right. So we're actually, by, I just think we have to think about when we borrow that we've been able to take on a very large project, but it doesn't mean that that 500 number, I think you have to bring that debt into account there, right? I mean, I, I'm glad that, you know, if we can figure out how to make it work, but we're really, we're not just if the previous years were 350 or 360,000 and all of a sudden now we're really, we're really at 557, we're not at five. I mean, th I think that's one thing that we have to think about when we do take debt is, I think, I, I don't know, I just think it makes sense. I understand, well, I Chris, what, what you're- I think what you're saying is leave everything else that we do off. Yeah. If we were just gonna pay Maple Street, this year and pay our debt, and that was the only thing we had to do, we'd have to raise $557,000 right. to pay Maple Street, right? That's, that's really- Well, yeah, that's part of what I'm saying, but also, so I understand Chris's concern on stacking debt. I would like to understand and, and see something that lays out the $1.4 million a year based on, I'd assume, length, amount of road, I'd assume, degradation schedules for each road and then estimated costs. I would assume that's where you back calculate 1.4 million. Is this a number that you've seen, Bill? He talked about it a couple of years ago at town meeting. So, I mean, that is very, I, I mean, I totally agree with you. If that's the number, then we definitely need to talk about, but I just would want to see that. Um, my thing would be is if we don't borrow to do a project like Maple Street, it might not allow us to do maintenance stuff like Neyland Flats. So that's one of my concerns about taking large projects on without debt to protect the ability to have budget to do maintenance. Yeah, I, I get what you're yeah. trying to do here. My concern is walking us down a path that you might never get yourself out from under and when it comes crunch time to have to borrow something on something that we were unprepared for you outside of raising substantial taxes to be able to cover that borrowing um, you, you're never gonna this is you know paving is one of those things where it's secular I guess you know it's 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 cycle life cycle and you, we can argue that is you know at its minimum seven years, at its maximum 15 years, 10 years is probably a more realistic slot because even at 10 years, even at seven years, you're starting to spend money on maintenance, patching and crack filling and, you know, those types of things. Uh, so it's a very, uh, the, under the conditions, cir circumstances in which we pave our roads, it's very um, volatile. It's it's uh, it's not a secure bet as far as uh, it's it's something that you if you start to walk that path based on the paved roads that we have out in front of us that are in serious condition, we will be in a position to have to borrow every year. Uh, I think it's inevitable, <laughs> but I'm just wondering if we should be borrowing on paved roads or if we should be borrowing on bridges where we know we're going to get a better lifespan, uh, you know, better amortization out of those types of projects and try to stick with paying cash for 
our paved roads uh, because of the life expectancy is either so even with our borrowing or or even less than our borrowing. You know, you know what I mean. The life expectancy. Could we take of the? But the. Rub mark, and I, I agree with what you're saying, Chris. But as you know, the the aggregate number of being in the hole is the two two eighty six or two eighty six or whatever the number was that I read a minute ago. It, so it, it really doesn't matter which one we you know we. Whether we borrow and put it in the fire CIP or put it in the sure. infrastructure CIP, it's just it's that bottom number. We've got. This but if we think paving is causing the basically complete depletion of CIP, then well, I think that I think I I'm think trying that, to have a bigger I that bigger that conversation paving, because we I had this conversation at least five times. Uh, in the past few years, but um, you know, I, I know I told you all back years and years ago when we first got the public works director in town, 12, 13 years ago, whatever it was, the board asked and Alec put together a plan and at the time it was supposed to be, whatever, $350,000 a year to, to pave to keep up with what we needed to do and the board chose to Budget 180 to 200,000, so they were 150 thousand dollars or so behind, and that kind of stayed in place. Incrementally, it went up a little bit, and then the last couple years, starting with Perry Hill, where we borrowed, we jumped up to half a million, and we've been on the upper side of the high 300s to, you know, about 500 for three three years or so now and the amount of money that we're putting into the CIP hasn't gone up. So I'm not trying to blame it all on paving, it's just we've decided to try to catch up with our problem mm -hmm. and we haven't increased the amount of money that we're putting aside. Um, I think we can do a little bit of both. I'm, I'm just concerned to not put any more money aside and just rely on all borrowing I think is a little risky. So I'd like to maybe suggest an alternative. Um, I hate to do this, but under the circumstances, I guess I'm going to throw out anything at this point. The 148,000 for the new tandem um, is that amortized out, or is that just a one-time expenditure? Right now, it's just a one-time expenditure. Uh, any idea what's in line for next year's replacement of highway vehicles? Yeah. Are we no better off next year? A loader, a trailer, which is next to nothing. And loader's probably what, 150? That's what it says here. Back That's what they got suggested there, yeah. yeah. And then the, uh, that mini excavator that we have is supposed to go next year, too. I didn't know if we could take a look at that tandem and see if it's worth kicking it out another year. That's uh, That would be two cents on the tax rate right there, but... Uh, I just, you know, to put our problems off till next year, that's, that's half the reason that. we're in the boat we're in. <laughs> I don't think we should you do know. that. Uh, it, yeah. Because, you know, part of the problem is if you do that, then the, you know, the cost of the vehicle is going to go up a little bit and the trade-in value is going to go down. $58,000 for this truck, they're not going to give you $58,000 a year from now for this truck. Oh, no, I totally understood that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's that's part of the risk of doing that. Um, I guess, you know, we, we haven't looked at the operating budgets yet. Um, what, what I'd like to get a sense from you about is if you kind of indicate 
w how much of a tax increase, if any, you're willing to have for this year, then between tonight and Monday <coughs> next week, I can put things together and say, okay, we got to borrow this amount, we got to, we'll raise this amount of taxes, and, and we can go from there. Um, I'm a little concerned if you don't raise the taxes at all, um, and we do it all with borrowing. I know we've got some capacity. Uh, I've already talked with the cemetery commissioners. You know, the cemetery fund has, I don't know, I didn't bring it with me, but probably $400,000 in the cemetery fund. I sold us uh, all the portfolios. I sold off um, some of the cream that we made in 2019 in the stock market. You know, many of our portfolios saw uh, 20, 25% increases this year. So I took some money out just to guard against a fall in the stock market. And, you know, the 116000 that we need for the um, roadside mower, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't just borrow that from the cemetery fund. We'll pay the cemetery fund 4% interest over the next five years and be done with it. And, you know, we're not... We're not raising taxes for it. We're not uh, borrowing and paying money to the bank. We'll pay 4% to the, to the cemetery, and they can't get 4% on a $116,000 CD or money market. They can probably get half that. So there's some things that we can do to borrow from ourselves. That but that doesn't fix your bottom line number, right? Because you have loan proceeds of 116 to offset that spend, right? So all that does is a balance sheet shift. Right. I mean, the, um, that, that, that in and of itself won't, won't reduce this to, to, to the, uh, three to four cents that I'm talking about. It's just a matter of where it goes. Um, Can you remind us what a penny on the tax rate raises? Yeah. It's just, it's, 75 dollars, or 75,000 or 74, 75. About seventy-five, seventy-six thousand dollars So can you give me an idea or give us an idea of what, just for argument's sake, what four cents on a $400,000 house would be? Additional or total? Additional. I guess what I'm concerned about, I'll, I'll cut right to the chase here. At some point, we're going to be in the position where we're just going to have to cough up the money. Now, either we cough it up in a large amount or we decide to put it to the voters to raise taxes over the next couple of years incrementally to such an amount that it keeps us from having to borrow ourselves to death with the end result being the same anyway that, at, you know, whether it be five years from now, based on the things that I perceive that are in front of us that you're not going to get a, you're not, you're going to be able to borrow your way, your way out of it. Um, I'd rather Put it to the voters if they, I mean, I guess you can't put it two two different scenarios, can you? You can't say either cough it up now or amortize it out. Which would you prefer to do? Uh, so to answer your question, um, a $400,000 house at last year's tax rate, 51 cents, pays $2,040 in municipal tax. And if you increase it by four cents, that's one hundred and sixty dollars. So it goes to twenty two hundred. And twenty two hundred divided 
that's a 7.8% increase, four cents on 51 cents is 78 But that actually comes out to 160 but it's $13 a month. Terry? You know, my fear is what are we going to end up spending in interest if we keep leveraging sure. ourselves no, out versus... I mean, the, the one thing is there is, a, I think, what, half of our debt is owned by ourselves, so... Yeah, and the, the interest that we're paying to ourselves, right. we're benefiting from because, you know, it right. goes into the when we borrow from the tax stabilization fund. So, so, so to that point, as time goes on here in the short term, costs of vehicles especially are going up at a rate in which those interest payments to ourselves will help us counter those additional costs and a lot of it's due to climate change initiatives you know uh, just the whole um, remodification of the engines you know three uh, Tier four, tier five, tier four motors. You know, uh, in, uh, fuel efficient, carbon free, or whatever. You know what I mean? Uh, emissions, emission standards. Uh, that's one of the drivers that's uh, pushing all these costs higher. Um, so there is a benefit to borrowing from ourselves, but the payback, obviously, to us, the benefit payback comes when that money accumulates after a while we have the ability to use it to pay down these yeah. rising costs. I guess a couple of things I'm thinking of are when do we go through the next potential line notes coming but um, when we reassess values of properties for the tax rate. So I talked to Dan Sweet this afternoon about that actually. Um, so our common level of appraisal right now is uh, about 94.5%. So that means we're 5.5% you know, below fair market value. Um, last year, I think the CLA was 96.2 or something like that. So we're losing about 2% a year right now. Um, the law says that you have to reappraise if your CLA gets to be 85% on the low side or 115% on the high side. We don't, never have to worry about the 115%. Um, so um, I'm thinking that probably we reappraised the last time, I can't remember if it was 2013 or 14. Um, and I'm thinking it's probably going to be 2000, my guess is 2025. I talked to Dan today and I said, well, you know, he's got a Listers Association meeting next week. I said, you know, can you start putting out feelers? I said, when we have to reappraise, you know, what are we going to do? We're probably going to have to contract it out because he doesn't have the ability, the, the time, actually, to, to, to do a full reappraisal. Um, the last reappraisal we did, you know, we actually hired Tom Vickery, and we're paying him um, fifty something thousand dollars a year. And then the two years that he did the reappraisal, we, we bumped that up. But Dan thinks we we'll probably have to contract out with somebody, and Dan could help. Um, so I'll stop there because I don't know if you have. Yeah. The, well, the reason I asked was just because. If we do, you know, as we look at potentially messing with the tax rate, I just want to make sure that wasn't on the back end of it that might see other another bump. I just didn't know the timing on when we might be looking at um, doing that. And then I guess. So in a perfect world, of course, if if you do a reappraisal and property values go up 10 percent, your tax rate will go down 10 percent, and nobody. It's it's the people that are further from the from the mean that have the problems. You know? Yep. Uh, because from one year to the next, you just raise the, the taxes that you, you vote to raise, and then you just apportion it through a through the tax rate against property values. So, so you have seen the rate go down? Oh, typically when we reappraise, the it rate, drops. The rate okay. will go down, yeah. 
you're still generating the same revenue because you got to service the debt, but it's just a different. Right. It just maybe levels out the. Your appraisal goes down. Your tax rate goes up. Your appraisal goes up. Your tax rate goes right. down. So it's. Uh, right. The the ones who get. But hurt, the amount out of pocket is still the same. The ones who get hurt are people out there that. You know, we're at 94 percent, but if your particular house is at 90 percent, then it, you know, if there's a reappraisal. Right. And everybody else goes up 6 percent, you go up 10 percent, and then the tax rate stays the same. Your taxes are going to Right, right. So along with the question about the four, four cents or what it would do to the tax the additional costs, do you have any sense based on what you've seen take place in, you know, in our best scenario here at our, our education costs. No, I, you couldn't contribute any, uh, any thought on that as far as what you think that increase might, might well, be we as well. We talked about it last week, didn't we? Right, yeah. A any idea what that would accumulate on top of the 160? Well, I got that paper in my other, in the other room. Is that the CLA paper that, because uh, I, didn't, we, didn't our CLA just get adjusted a little bit? Yeah, it went down a little bit. So do you remember from last week what the school tax rate? It, it was, uh, it was kind of, it they was voted a, on the on num a, number five, which yeah. was the 1.2. Percent increase that turned into a, a 1.2 million dollar budget savings. Yeah. And was, yeah, it was around two point something, right? Um, Actually, I might have it. Bill, have we ever re, um, you mentioned, and I, and I know I've been on the board long enough to, to hear that comment of years ago, the board was told X, Y, Z amount of money needed to be put into paving each year to keep up, basically. Have we revisited that? Or have we even considered revisiting that? And having someone that basically can lay that out for us again. I mean, I feel like that's the one thing that I'm struggling with a little bit is that I feel, I feel like I'd feel much more comfortable pushing numbers one way or the other if I have data behind it. And I think, you know, the quick and dirty way I think to do it would be to take the complete mileage of paved roads, divide that by cost per mile average to pave, and then say seven, it lasts seven years, and that would be a quick and dirty number, but it's probably not maybe the best way to go about it. But I guess I'm just trying to, I mean, I think I'm focused right on paving. I mean, my follow-up question would be back almost to what Chris was talking about. And I'm not saying we do anything with the tandem, but I, again, with vehicles, just understanding, you know, they have an exponential loss. You know, when you drive them off the lot, they, they, they lose significantly in the first year, the second year is like the, the percentage each year of loss of, of value, and basically the trading value for that one truck, I think was 57,000. You know, that year loss versus the, you know, the re-beginning of an amortized schedule of a $205,000 vehicle, if you look at it on a year, yearly basis or the short term, there's actually a huge loss in that first year of owning the, the new one. Um, and I know that you start to fight maintenance costs, and we got into that a little bit with um, the fire trucks and trying to determine whether or not we were going to go out and buy new ones. But... Um, you know, I just, as a board member, feel like I have to understand that we're believing that we're doing our, our due diligence, and, I, and I, I know that it's got to be a conversation you guys have often, but how far are we willing to take out some of these vehicles, especially the ones that are of huge expense, and where is that, I guess, sweet spot? Maybe that's what that is. Maybe the six years is the sweet spot on a yeah, tandem, and, but... And in a while, the, the paving one, I don't have a good answer on that one. When we first created the CIPs for the uh, vehicles, um, you know, we basically, it's kind of straight line depreciation. So I built, 
you know, it's a pretty complicated spreadsheet. I haven't used it for a few years now, but you know, I'd plug in, okay, the, the, the cost for the vehicle um, is $200,000, that tandem, right? And, and then I put an inflation in factor on it of whatever, 2%. And took that out in, for six years. So two hundred thousand dollars times one point oh two times one point oh two out for six years, and that becomes whatever two hundred. It's trailing cost of a new one. Two hundred sixty-five thousand yep. dollars for the new one, and then an estimate what you know sixty thousand dollar trade-in value at that time. So we've got to come up with two hundred ten thousand dollars to buy that truck the next year, and and I've done that and of course that's only as good as the next year's price increase if the price increase is three percent instead of two percent you're behind the curve right um, and then but what what always happens no matter what we've put together for a program you say we're going to trade the vehicles every five years or every six years or you know some vehicles are five some are six some are ten every time that we get to a 2018, because if some are five and some are seven and some are 10, at somewhere down the line, three of them are in the same year. Yeah. And then it always is, well, can we push this one out and push that one back? And unless you can just say, we're gonna live with the schedule no matter what. Well, and that's the danger of almost these, having the CIP buckets where it looks really bad in one bucket one year, but really, it's the culmination of all right. of them. Right. Thank you. And we used to have the one CIP. Right. Just, just all together. So I've got two charts here, and I'm not sure which one is. This so is the lower chart. Where what would be the harm in this is going back to the paving thing of just going this back five or six years? Yeah, I think it's all but up above. Where the amount we've spent. Coming up with some kind of a rough average. Uh, okay. like well, the said, question is: Is are we keeping up or not? Because if we look at what we've spent, it might not be what we needed to spend. Right, I understand that. But if we, I mean, we don't even know the mileage of paved roads. But if, it, if we could go back five or six years and, and find out how many miles of road we paved or repaved or ground and rebuilt um, as a portion of the total, and then we come up with kind of a dollar average of you know, something that needed serious work like the rebuilding of something from the base up and then something that just needs to be ground skimmed, um, you know, we could get an idea. Most of our paved roads at this point are at the point of the worst case scenario, reconstruction uh, level, total reclaim, grind and reclaim, basically reconstruct and then repave. Um, well, I think that a lot of the, our short sections. That so might that, be that might be the case on some of the heavily traveled roads. Right. We have a lot of paved roads. You know, we just basically we overlay E Street, I think, um, Butler Street, those kind of streets. You know, we're not going in and doing complete. You know, we might mill it, but we're not doing a complete reclaim right. on all those roads. What I'm saying is that a lot of our, we've really hammered the crap out of a lot of our shorter, less traveled roads. To try to catch up, you mean? Yeah, you know, so we're down to basically the big nut ones now that, that uh, dominate our paving uh, list. And then the other thing is too, I mean, do you recall 
when we had the discussion about the bridge over here, uh, was that a seven year life expectancy or five year? I can't remember. Bill might remember. I knew it was either, either or. You know, I think it was five cage best five year best. Talking about the bridge seven right here worse. by the train trestle, the, the bridge that we were presented with. I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Right there by the roundabout, just before it, here under, under the trestle. I thought it was a. When we decided to kick that out, it was a five-year life expectancy or seven. I forget, and we got to be encroaching on that. So I'm wondering what will uh, happen when, when the that. Will be to remove existing concrete deck and construct new deck early 2016 construction estimates for $350,000 estimate for 2020, $413,000 for that bridge. For 2020? Yeah. That's this year. <laughs> so if we kick it down the road another three or four years. You know, right, I mean, is, is there a limit? It went from 350 to 413. I, I guess my question is, is there a limit as to how many years we kick it out before it's condemned? <laughs> yeah, in the brook. <laughs> so in 2019, the homestead school tax was $1.68.2. And for Number five for this year, it's 174. So it's like six cent increase in the school tax. So four cents represents 160. You'd be probably in the two and a quarter range. Five, yep. Like yep. So two and a quarter and 160. So if you, if you make it 10 cents, less than, right? Six cents for the school and four cents for us. Yes. Yeah. Ten cents yeah. on a four hundred thousand dollar home. That's four hundred dollars. Right. How many other? I mean, you started to go through the list, Chris, of these. The Maple Street, Butler Street, the, all the list of the like, the large. Up toll. Right now, unless I'm mistaken, we've got Blush Hill, Barnes Hill, Maple Street, uh, Guptill Road. What was the other one you just mentioned? Uh, I, don't know, I think those are. Is there one I'm forgetting? Well, we're, we're taking care of Maple this year, so. Next year, there'll be there'll be Blush Hill, Barnes Hill, Capitol Road, and then we did Perry, we did Loomis, so Newland Flats at some point will have to be. And Loomis, we took no debt, so the only debt within that CIP is Perry. When does that expire? Do you remember? Um, the ten-year note yeah, or it's ten, so two thousand twenty-five something. Say we're about halfway through that. Right. So that's, I mean, I still, I mean, I, I totally understand and respect the comment about concern on taking on debt, but I still just think that if it's, if it's five different roads that we're talking about, and maybe at times we can pick them off um, without taking debt, which we did it with Loomis. Um, if we're looking at this year, concerns surrounding you know, a school budget that might force a large increase and we can take Maple Street in debt, I just think that it needs to be considered. Um, you know, if, as that goes on to say a 10 year, five years out, Perry falls off, you know, you're starting to look at, I mean, like, and that's where I have to really understand what ultimately we should be spending a year because I just, I, my, con, my, my concern again is, I'm gonna state is that I'm concerned on taking a large project and not being able to do the smaller ones that also need to be addressed, especially any maintenance work. Because if we took Maple Street as a bond, or put 
Maple Street out for debt this year to a vote, when would we even start paying on that next year? Yeah, if we, if we, if we, there's two ways to do it, um, but we would have to pay some interest at the, at the least next year. Um, you know, if you don't pay your principal, obviously, it costs a little bit more in the long run. But if we were to do a bond vote, uh, we would get the money late this summer, and our first principal payment would be in November of 21. If we borrow money just from the bank on a straight five-year note, our first principal payment would be a year from whenever we borrowed the money. When we did, when we did the Perry Hill project, and what I've kind of contemplating on the fire trucks is, we borrowed five hundred thousand dollars from the bank in two thousand fifteen. Let's say I don't remember if it was fourteen or fifteen, but we borrowed money from the bank, a half a million dollars, to do Perry Hill. And then the next year, the select board made a motion to convert that note into a bond, and the bond bank paid us a half a million dollars. We paid the People's United Bank off the half a million, and we paid them interest. So in that first year, we made an interest payment, no principal payment, and, and then the 10-year amortization started. So Perry Hill, the project is actually being financed over 11 years. So let's take Perry Hill for example then. So, you know, we're, we're going to have a certain life expect, expectancy of that road. What is the expectation starting from when we did that project a couple of years ago of when the next time we would need to address that road and what, what would be the sweet spot of taking a road like that and, and maintaining it? And can you get into a rhythm of overlays or do you eventually I mean I guess I don't know I still don't fully understand feeling that like I know how to maintain these roads Probably right that's a different idea than me but from my perspective what what I would hope on Perry Hill we've started you know we've done some crack filling and stuff like that already to try to lengthen out uh, and to protect the investment that we have but I if we could overlay that somewhere in the 10 to 12 year time frame after we paved it, I think that would be a, a, a good uh, good s scheme. Yeah, it'd be, it'd you know, be a we, good. We reconstructed it basically in say 15, somewhere between 25 and 27. If we overlaid it, I think that would. And does an overlay disrupt? Is it, do you pull the surface off at all, or do you just go right over it? And just go over just it. Just go over it with a couple of things. But I guess, I mean, that's, that's a, a scenario that will have to play out in 10 years when, when that, you know, when we see what kind of condition well, that road's in at that five point. years from now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But that, that and, and, you know, ideally, he's right. Ideally, you'd, you'd like to overlay it after seven years if you could. But I don't think we want to be paying a bond for three more years plus right. overlaying. That's that's my you concern. It would be nice that's if we could get on a schedule if we had to borrow, say, for Barnes Hill, I mean, for Maple Street. If we had to borrow for Maple Street to amortize it over seven or eight years as opposed to 10 or 12 would be ideal. Well, that's where I just want to make sure that we're you know, basically when you say ideal, are you saying that if we don't do it at year seven and we do it at year 12, it's gonna have a significantly shorter lifespan? No, it's not. I, I'm, I'm gambling that in year 12, an, an overlay may not be possible. Uh, we're in what year on Neal and Flats right now? Any idea? We must be in year six or seven, right in that ballpark. I think. Six, and and six, ideally, we need to be overlaying that right now. Well, if you let that road go another five years, you can forget overlaying it. Well, that's so. This is a great example of my concern of if, say, we took dead on Maple 
debt on Maple to overlay Neyland Flats to protect that investment. And, you know, we it's a year delay or whatever, somewhat of a year delay, but it saves that other investment of that other road. And then, you know, in four or five years, Perry Hill's debt falls off. You know, to me, that's a better way to start protecting and being set up and, and looking at the long-term strategy. Even if you pay a little bit more on interest, you're not fully rebuilding roads. I just, I, I, you know, like these decisions are made in these couple meetings sometimes, and I'm just concerned. <laughs> yeah, I know. Again, I go back to the fact that the chickens are coming home to roost, and either we got to belly up and and bite the bullet to try to get back to where we need to be, uh, and to a more manageable state. It's going to cost us out the gazoo here one way or another, and I'm more concerned about overlapping debt. Uh, that doesn't that outlives the life expectancy of the project that we're borrowing it for. That's my bigger concern because well, we're not we're not talking about doing that, are we? I mean, well, I guess if you put a road on a ten year and it needs to be overlaid in seven, that's a problem. Yeah, and especially I don't know if you've been up Maple Street lately. I mean, that road is problematic. It's it's you know there's a speed bump every twenty five feet. Uh, it's there's something going on there. There's, there's, there's water that runs. Yep. groundwater. Yeah, it's high. It's a high, uh, high level groundwater during the. Now is that when season. we're talking about redoing Maple Street? Is there anything that that's going to address some of that, or not, or is it just a? Not really. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's a couple culverts that to be changed, but that's water table stuff. Yeah, it's water not, table. Not stuff. Really gonna be able to do Only that. one way to do it, and uh, <laughs> we can't head in that direction. So, so start with an F. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what you're saying <clears throat> is all things be if you could, you're saying let's pay a half a million dollars and borrow that to do Maple Street and then spend another and I don't have the number of this ground and number out of the two hundred thousand probably another hundred and fifty thousand to overlay Neil Flats. Flats. As long as I understood if we don't do that decision, what's the expense down the road? See, like I think those are the those are the tipping points that I feel like are. I mean, and I think it speaks to your point of your concern over that road or roads like that that we've invested this money and there's an opportunity to overlay and get a significant number of years out of them, and then your per year cost is going down significantly for those roads. Versus just letting them go, and it, which I, I mean, I guess once they go, like Maple Street, for example, has probably been gone from the ability to overlay for a significant number of years, and That's right. every That's year, it's similar to the the truck conversation of you push it another year out, and another year out, but eventually, you know, everything piles up. Right. Well, yeah, but I just so, so just trying to, to understand to, what the right yeah. strategy is here. So there's, you know, there's there's two there's two ways to. Uh, to get more information that you're kind of looking for. One is to, you know, have Alec try to do a much more comprehensive program. Um, I don't have what he did, what we looked at a few weeks ago with him, but he's, he's done that. It's not every single road. Um, the other way, I mean, everything costs money. You can hire an engineering firm and have them come in and do an engineering study and, and pay them $50,000 to come in and tell you what to do. Um, the downside of it is, is it's $50,000 that you could have paid a certain road with. And the, the second reality is that when the five of you get off the board and you present that plan to the next select board, if they don't fund it, then, you know, we've been there a couple of times. And, and so can I ask you this? Maybe, maybe we're having this discussion for, of how to fund this thing 
uh, for, for no reason. Is there a way of proposing this to the taxpayers at town meeting in a two-way two scenario of, number one, will you authorize the, town, the municipality to spend X amount to pave Maple Street, first question. Second question, how do you prefer to pay for it? Borrow, amortize for whatever scenario you put together, or bite the bullet and put it on your tax rate and be done with it. Can we do that and let them decide? Yeah, I think you can. There's, there's two ways you can do it. Probably the cleanest way is to have two articles on the warning yep. and take the first one, which would be you want to spend this money and, and borrow, have that be the first question. Right. And then um, I mean, you could do it either way. Uh, but typically, we have a motion that says, shall the voters authorize the select board to appropriate up to $500,000 to pave Maple Street yeah. and to authorize borrowing on terms and conditions uh, you know, that the select board deems best. So when they give you the authority to spend, they also give you the authority to borrow, but you can make that authority to borrow that the select board can then decide whether it wants to borrow. If you get the authority to borrow a half a million and you decide to borrow 200,000, that's okay. You could decide to borrow nothing. I guess I'm interested in letting them make the choice as to how it affects their pocketbook with an explanation as to perhaps a little bit of view into some of these other paving projects that are yet to come. Uh, the difficulty, I think, is, you know, do you want to do you want to exclusively have it focused on paving? And, and it's like we've got this deficit in five capital budgets aggregately, and. And you know when the CIP was first established, um, the vote was shall the voters authorize the select board to bond up to I think ten years for six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to establish the CIP fund, and then you know uh, do these particular projects. So they just gave the select board money for the whole thing, and and. Uh, so from a financial standpoint then, are you suggesting that the problems we face from infrastructure, managing our equipment replacement, could be better done from a fiscal standpoint uh, if it were put back into its whole or are, are we going to jeopardize some aspect of these individual CIPs as they currently are and come up short? You know, if we're robbing from Peter to pay Paul, well, I, I does that put us, how does that aff I don't think affect you're really, us? I, I don't think, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that we should go back to one CIP. Effectively, that's what we have. Because when you look at this, Fund 70, um, you know, we can go back several years. Fund 70 has been underwater for, for a number of years now. I mean, you know, uh, we budgeted for 2019, a year ago, we budgeted to spend $370,000, I mean, to take in $370,000 of revenue and spend using Mark's calculation, $628,000, which includes $58,000 of uh, debt service. And, you know, if we did exactly what we planned to do last year, the paving CIP was going to be $300,000 in the hole. It's just that we had 
four hundred thousand dollars in the fire CIP, and it you know washed it off. So we're in effect using an aggregate CIP right now. These CIP funds are they're all borrowing from one another as you know they all have lean years and and uh, you know robust years in terms of what gets spent or not spent. And they all fluctuate up and down, and we're borrowing one from the other all the time. But we're pretty close to the boat. We, you know, if everything worked out right to the penny in 2019, we would have ended with $30,537 in the bank. And now this year we want to pay $500,000. And we just, we can't do it without borrowing just by putting what we're putting aside. So, so from my perspective, as, as much as I hate either scenario, borrowing or raising taxes and just being done with it, if I had to choose one of the two, I'd rather just rip the Band-Aid off and say, raise the initial taxes, pay for the son of a gun, and let's go into next year with a cleaner slate because next year we're going to be back here facing a similar set of issues that... Like, I guess my question on the Band-Aid is, are we just trying to get that CIP number to zero? Is that... Well, <laughs> I don't want it less than zero. But zero, okay. we're pretty close to zero. I mean, we were pretty close to zero for 2019. And to get it to zero, you know, I can do a little work, and I think a three cent tax rate would be able to get it to zero. I mean, my goal is to keep on the paving progress that we've been able to muster up in the last few years here that we're still underfunding, in my opinion, but yet we're gaining ground. Uh, but our, and again, as I've said it a million times, our roads are at a point where, you know, I don't know if they can, they certainly can get worse, but from a cost perspective to repair, can they, can they get worse to the point where they're going to, you know, really cost us a lot more money? Or are they just at that point where there's only one way to treat them and it's the most costly way to deal with it, whether they're as bad as they are now or if they sit another five years and, and deteriorate, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I'm not trying to dig my heels in on the non-movement of the tax rate, but I think... You know, even if we do take the the position of saying we're gonna we're gonna look for a higher tax rate, I still think I would want an answer on the number of roads that if we don't do something like an overlay to address them next year, we'll lose the opportunity to protect them. I think that's something that I need to understand because if the answer is yes and these are the roads and we need to do them next year and this is the future money we're saving, and by, if you don't do them, then I'm gonna say that we should still consider borrowing for Maple Street and do those projects. Looking at the bigger picture, I think is what I really need to understand there. Um, and I don't know how quickly Alec can do that kind of work, or... Well. I mean, like, I don't know, you, you... I think... That's why I said I think the simple solution is, you know, it may sound a little bit complicated, but put it to the voters, let them decide. And they may say, you know something, our it's taxes are going up high enough. Huh? It's too complicated. The, to the difficulty, though, is that I don't know, you know, the, the actual ability to get more than a half a million dollars worth of work done. Sure. You know, because we're already, you know, Woody and I met with Celia the other day, and, you know, she's already scheduling to do stuff on Maple Street early in the year. You've got to change culverts and everything else. And, and I'm not sure we can do a whole lot more than Maple Street in, in this year. But if you, if you put up to the voters to borrow on Maple Street, and then you could drop that paving to 300,000, right? Because you're basically... The paving is, all it's gonna, the paving, the budget, the expense side has to have what you're gonna spend in it. 
so because you're yeah, going to get the money reimbursed to you later. Is that just going to have to go out? You're just going to you'll have money coming in. If you're trying to squeeze an overlay in here, um, I don't know that that affects the highway department at all. It's, but yeah. on on Neal and Flats, they would just come in and overlay it. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the same company that do Maple Street as well, but. Um, well, you get a lot better price if you. Well, obviously, <laughs> sure, if they can squeeze it in, but if they're overbooked and, you, you know, that's just, that's a, a question that'd have to be answered by, yeah. by them. But I don't think between now and when we have to have this ready for going to the, you know, we, you got to sign a warning next week. And I don't think we're going to be able to get much more than we have. I mean, Alex given us a report now. I can sit down with Alec and Woody and say, on this sheet that you have here, is there anything that we could overlay? Um, you know, it's not just the paving that is, you know, are we going to do the roof on the highway garage? Are we going to do the roof on the recreation building? I think we've got to buy the vehicles. So. Um, you know, we could probably pick another road, and you know, we've already talked about how it have if we can do that one while we're right up there. Um, so between now and next week, there's not a lot of opportunity to do a whole lot of analysis. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, again, I'm, I'm going to stick to my guns there. If there's any way we can put this to the voters to let them make the choice, that I. Well, what's that choice again? To either. Um, Amortize out Maple Street, or now is Maple Street in itself going to take the the three cents? When you, the four when cents. You look three, at four the cents. bottom of the page that we looked at together to get the thing to get the CIPs to zero. What was the number that we had there? Three eighteen four oh six. I think what you had was two forty eight one fifty one and I had three something higher than that, right? Oh, four and four and a quarter four cents. Four oh six was four cents. So to get to zero, we either have to borrow three 318, or we got to raise 318, or a combination of both. Right. And I kind of thought we'd be doing a combination of both. I was figuring that maybe you'd want a two cent tax increase and then some borrowing for the other 150 or whatever it is. Um, and if the you want to have more in the CIP at the end of the year, and we do all these things, you're going to have to raise or borrow more. Yeah. So there again, that's another, if you had a crystal ball and you could look into it, interest rates between now and next year, cheaper to borrow this year, cheaper to borrow next year, you don't know those questions. Well, it's, it's hard to borrow cheaper than this year. Uh, it, so, it might go there up. you go then. It's you just made a go good down. point. It's, it's unlikely that interest rates are going to go down significantly. And of course, that. and again, I'll say it again, my, my concern is Borrowing on something that deteriorates so quickly um, in the in the you know problems leading into that, if you continue to have to do that, um, and then there's the economy, you know. Um, so if we borrowed, if if we got in this CIP, you got thirty six thousand and $10,000 or $11,000 for roofs. So right there, you, you can, if you borrow for 10 years, you get $50,000, the roofs are gonna last 20 years. So it's, it's not all paving. Everything in this thing that we're looking at isn't something that's gonna deteriorate and be done in five years. You know, the tandem and the one ton, you know, they're gonna last five to six years. We can, we can borrow for those. You know, you can borrow um, whatever the sum of that is for five years, amortize that over five years, and 
they'll, the trucks might last six years or so. That gets you a little bit of money. It doesn't have to be that, you know, it's, we just need to borrow or raise about $300,000. We've got to do at least that. Does Main Street Project fall off in 2021? Main Street Project has, in 2020, whatever this number is, 190, and then 2021, it will be 60, probably, and that's it. So there'd be a significant fall off there. Yeah. And we didn't borrow f for that, you know, and, and that. The, the town's cost for that um, the project cost is uh, twenty-one million dollars. The local share altogether, all in non-participating costs and everything else, is four hundred eighty-two thousand seven twenty-two. Of that, the town share is about three sixty-five. So you could borrow three hundred sixty-five thousand dollars and just say it's to pay for a 50-year Main Street project, because they're not going to be back to do Main Street for 50 years, I guarantee you. It's taken 30 years to, to get this done. So you could, you know, you could borrow that just for, for that portion of it. I mean, I guess in the end of the day, when we're looking at what the actual I think the, the town portion of the property tax compared to what the school portion is, that $13 on $400,000 at the 4% increase to get what we need to get done. Is, I hate saying it, but it's probably not. A, I mean, I think we have to seriously consider it. I mean, if we pose it, yeah, I, if we pose it to the voters in a kind of a two part scenario. They're either going to give us one of those options or they're going to nix it right from the budget. No, we're not spending this money, period. Yeah, right. and if we go in and they say we're not spending this money. Which is pretty unlikely because our roads <laughs> are in such a condition that you can't continue to ignore them. It's just you're beyond that point. You, right. I mean, I, I so that I really didn't need the calculator to do it. So the the school tax is seventy five percent of the tax rate. The town's is point four point. If we raised it to fifty five cents, that's a four cent increase, and the school goes up to one seventy four. Fifty five so into two twenty nine. The school tax is seventy five percent. And it's it's, it's and gone it's down. It's worse <laughs> because it used to be eighty-five you know, percent. No, no, it used to be less. Than, it used to be like 70, 30, 65 when I first came here. But it's it's going the wrong direction. I don't know, I, I, Bill. You said you came into this meeting think you could ex you could explore on option of like a 2% or 2 cent increase and then some borrowing to, to lower the impact. Maybe maybe we need to just look at that. Yeah, I don't want to belabor this. I mean, either way, you're either way, you're footing the bill. Uh, just I'm trying, trying to head off some overlap in the, in the coming years. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's It's a fact. We're going to have to pay the bill. So. There's no getting out of the, the cost of operating this town. Period. Right. So let me ask a question a different way. And I don't know even know how, how I feel about it yet. but. When we, when we used to borrow for trucks or anything that we borrowed for five years, I would go to the bank and say, we, the town wants to borrow $100,000. Uh, we've got authority to borrow it for five years. Give me an interest rate and 
uh, give me two ways. One, give me a flat interest rate that's good for five years, and the second one was give me an interest rate for one year. And we always took the interest rate for one year. Let's say the interest rate for a year was uh, 2% and the interest rate for five years was 2.5%. And I can't do the math in my head, but every year, because you paid off 20% of the principal, next year you would be borrowing 80,000 instead of borrowing 80,000 at the 2.5% or whatever the higher rate was. You'd borrow 80,000, and even if the interest rates went up incrementally, you were still paying lower interest than you were before. So, you know, we're borrowing from ourselves right now um, for the purpose, for two purposes. One, because we need to finance it uh, and we can't just pay cash for it. But two, we've got a lot of money sitting in the bank and we can't get a good uh, fixed in interest rate on those loans and uh, I mean on that on those portfolios and what we were ending up doing was having too much money above what our policy said we should have in uh, equities and not enough in fixed income so in order to kind of rebalance the portfolio and and uh, have a reasonably good paying yield on that fixed balance, fixed income portfolio, we're paying ourselves 4% on the loan. Now this isn't gonna make a, a huge difference at all, but you know, maybe for a couple of years for these loans, we can pay ourselves back 2% or 2.5% to give us, it's a couple thousand dollars difference that will Give us we'll some relief. Pay ourselves. And as long as we're paying ourselves interest uh, at a higher rate than we could get, leaving it in a similar uh, uh, investment of similar risk, right. uh, we're doing better for ourselves. So, you know, we, we've got some capacity to borrow from ourselves. And, and you know, even if instead of paying 4%, we paid 3%. That's a, what, 25% reduction in interest rate, right? Or 30%, something like that. So I can put together some scenarios, but you know, the other, I was hoping that when we got all said and done, that if we would have a tax rate increase of maybe 3%, three cents, I would be happy about that feeling that I kind of, did my job. Um, if you want, I can go back and you know get you some information by Wednesday or Thursday this week, so you have a little time to think about it. If you want to call me and talk about it, you can do that. But we're going to have to make a decision one way or the other by Monday. And Chris, we you know Carla and I can work on some language for the articles. And if you want to have, you know. If you pass this, then you pass over that. If you don't pass this, you take up that, and hopefully one of them passes, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know that one wouldn't pass. Uh, it just gives them the ability in their own mind to to know what they're going to be dealing with, uh, and whether they want to just be upfront and deal with it, or if they want to try to stretch it out. Uh, yeah. Because they're the ones that are footing the bill. We, well, we all are. But there's a lot more of them than there is a, a bus sitting here. <laughs> Bill, what is the transfer this year out of the... Um, yeah. And you know me with debt. I hate debt. So I, that's why I'm, that's why I prefer to just rip the band aid and, and pay the bill. Because I know there's going to be another one right behind it <laughs> next year.
And maybe next week, too, Mike will be here and he can put his two cents in. Right, but without and that, Jane. we would have been paying a million dollars for fire trucks. What would that have done to the tax rate? What's that? The million dollars we took for fire trucks this year. I mean, you have to take debt for the well, large no, that, single that, year investments. Right. Those are yeah. those are the types of things where you can amortize them out long enough to get your money's worth out of them. Yeah. You know. I don't know if you agree with that, but there's a balance for sure. Right. Well, I, I, as I've said many times, you know, when something has a life of 10 or 20 years that you know has that life, I think that's the way that you should pay for those because it spreads it over the cost of the, of the uh, life of the building or the improvement and everybody who's using it is paying for it. Um, but, you know, there is certainly when you have to borrow and pay 10 years to afford something when the thing has a seven year life, then that's right. not good. Right. So. But I mean, and like you pointed out, I think the ability that, I mean, I, unlike a lot of other towns, when we're taking on debt, not all of it's sitting with interest being paid outside of the municipality, we're capturing that interest, right. which is a, it's hugely beneficial. And you right. said we paid down that one, that debt $200,000 and the interest from those loans has gone into back into that fund, right? Right, exactly. You know, I, I didn't go get the debt full. Let me get that quickly. I think that's a really important thing that we just have to remember is if he's talking about taking 100 or 200,000 in debt from ourselves at a rate of 3% that we couldn't get, <coughs> safely get outside of, if our, investment strategy says we don't put X percentage at risk within the market and you have to move to cash or find lower risk options and the lower risk is us investing and it changes yearly based on basically what our needs are for that specific year. That's a pretty, that's a pretty huge opportunity to continue to make these this whole number work because eventually you pay that debt down and it's now sitting back on your balance sheet as cash or whatever else and you can borrow against it again. And I don't disagree. I'm yeah. just, you know, we got a couple hundred thousand of capacity to borrow against ourselves right now and I guess my fear is that, I, well, my per preference is to hang on to that ace in the hole till perhaps next year uh, when it might be more important to us. but. But we're paying down every year, so we're we're recouping those opportunities to borrow once again, whether it's our own debt or other debt. And he's laid it out in that whole de debt service, and that's where the million dollars that we borrowed for fire trucks isn't as impactful as maybe we thought it was, because we do have debt that's expiring. I mean, I think it's very important to, I think that's what he's going to get right now, but it's important to understand how we're taking debt and when when and how, and I agree with you, sure, I totally understand. That's why I want, to, I want us to make sure we're looking 10 years out on, or 10 or farther on vehicles and paving and all that stuff that's gonna, and buildings and infrastructure and all of that is so important to start to build those schedules so there, it shouldn't be surprises every year. We should know for the most part when these large expenses are coming at us. I mean, the fire trucks we did, like, we knew they were, they were looming. Yeah, I, I'm just question to myself, and I'll throw it out there aloud, is uh, I'm curious to know from, from uh, a fiscally responsible standpoint, if let's say the economy goes in a dumper here in the next two years, uh, are we better to have the capacity to borrow then or, you know, in order to try to solve the problems that we're faced with, or are we going to be smarter to just try to ask 
the residents uh, to pony up when the economies, you know, that's just a, a question that I run through my head as, out of curiosity, you know. I, I'd like to know, I'd kind of like to know what that answer is. Uh, what changes in terms of on our side when the economy goes down other than? Well, I just, uh, you know, our capacity to, our capacity to continue to borrow, how, where is the limit for us as far as, you know, based on the population in the town and, and the ability to absorb debt, uh, you know, where's that fine line when it gets to the point where people just can't afford it anymore and, uh, and the economy drops off, you know, what's the better scenario at, the, at, at that point? So do we, do we over leverage ourselves now in the next couple of years and put ourselves at risk or does that, is that not a risk? You know, I, th those are just questions that are hypothetical uh, to some degree, you know, but certainly could take place if, uh, if we weren't careful, you know. I just don't want to box us into a corner. <clears throat> so if we, right now, we owe ourselves um, <coughs> $667,000. So for every, uh, if we drop the interest that we paid ourselves by 1% from 4% to 3%, it would save us, you know, $6,800 about What's the total value of the uh... total debt? Yeah, it's a little over five million. Five point one four something. Did we? Um... So we're not gaining. Uh, we're not going to gain a, any uh, real benefit from cutting a couple percent. Well. Every $6,000 that you, you save, you know, yeah. you do it 10 times and you save 10. What were you going to say, Mark? Sorry. Oh, um, I was just wondering because the initial, the way this thing originally started was basically debt, right? You took $650,000 in debt. So that CIP was originally sitting with a $650,000 note, right? Well, if you want to take the time and put the scenarios together and plop them in front of us next week, and we'll be under the gun to have to make a decision. So we got a week to think about it. And I'm not here next week, unfortunately. But... Huh? <laughs> Come on. In Canada. Oh, Canada. Mm -hmm. You Did spend you a lot of time up there. Most of this week? Yes. Uh, not that we're going to have a meeting. I just want to try to get stuff to you. I'll have my phone and everything. I leave Wednesday morning. And, yeah, of course, I'm headed up to Holland tomorrow for the rest of the week, but I can be in touch or you can be in touch with me. Yep. I know I owe you an annual report that I'll have to you in time, one way or another. No petition. Yeah, it's in my pocket. <coughs> Are we doing the parks and highway budgets tonight? It's up to you. I mean, I sent them out. Um, they're pretty much uh, maybe, so let's maybe look at them quickly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's
See that salt's highlighted? <laughs> yeah, now's the time to maybe deal with it. All right, so on the highway budget, um, <coughs> starting at the top, uh, we had one employee that was on extended disability last year, about six weeks, I believe. And uh, while he was not here, uh, other people had to pick up the slack. And then we had a pretty hard winter last year. So um, we spent, you know, the, the total over spending in the highway budget comes to 29,441 in 2019. 27,000 was overspent in pay. So, uh, you know, everything else was basically right on the button. Um, let me see your page there. Uh, okay, so if you go out, I printed off enough. On that pay line proposed for 2020 is 382 500, which is about $8,000 less than we spent last year. If you go way out to the right, if we didn't have any overtime at all, um, the budget would be 357, 125, and um, that's that's for this year. Uh, last year it would have been slightly lower than that. Uh, it's probably unrealistic of me to expect that 363 would be a good number, but that's the number that we plugged in there. Um, 382. It's a, I think it's a closer number, but it's still less than we spent uh, in 2019. I'm hoping we don't have somebody who's, who's out, uh, because even though you don't pay that person for a number of weeks, when everybody else gets time and a half to pick up the slack, uh, the cost goes up. Um, you notice, Chris, you pointed it out, Last week in other budgets, the highway fund is the biggest fund, uh, except for the general fund where, where payroll lies and workers' compensation uh, is based on, uh, you know, it's based on a, a rate per employment category. So we pay 44 cents per hundred for administrative workers' comp, but for highway, it's like, you know, $8.75 or $9.28 per hundred. So uh, we lost 10 grand right there just in a workers' comp uh, increase. And then, you know, moving down the page, everything else is really within a few percentage points of each other. You know, the building maintenance line. It's 13% higher than it was budgeted for last year, but that's $2,000. It's, it's not like 13% equals $100,000. <coughs> it's a couple thousand dollars. Um, and, you know, the salt line, um, I highlighted that. You see what I budgeted last year? Uh, I went back five years uh, a year ago, and the year before that, and the year before that. And I kind of budget the average. Now, obviously, that works against us a little bit because things cost more now than they cost uh, five years ago in terms of price per ton. Uh, the average, five-year average for salt, including 2019 and 2015, was 50916 But in 2015, we must have had a really mild winter because we only spent $25,000 for salt that year. Uh, so I budgeted 58,250. It's significantly lower than what we spent in 2019. Celia would tell you that the fact that winters are getting warmer causes salt use to go higher because if it's 32 degrees and it snows, uh, it's really slippery, and you know you put salt on to get rid of it. And she said if we had winters where it was, you know, 20 degrees all the time, you wouldn't have to salt at all. So um, it's a risk to, to budget that little, but 
you know, it's a it's a six thousand dollar risk on a one point six million dollar budget, one point seven million dollar budget. So uh, there's not really a lot here that I think you can tamper with, but uh, if you feel you can, have at it. Bill, I have a weird question on um, on workers' comp. Are those policies held by just regular third-party insurance companies? Uh, we get our insurance through the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Okay. So it's, um, I can show you the as even though it's going up, uh, you know, we get benefit of ownership of the company. Yeah, I, I thought that was the case because I know that that. I know within even someone told me that I could basically become my own insurer at some point, and I thought that's how that worked, but or to a certain extent, but I wasn't sure. Well, you know, we're owners, but the, there's 200 members of of the uh, property insurance trust that VLCT operates. And just like every other insurance out there, some towns have good experience, some towns have bad experience, and you know the the formula by which they uh, send you a premium includes you know your experience as well as what's happening in the marketplace. It's just been a couple of bad years for us, unfortunately, um, and it's cyclical. Hopefully, we'll have a couple of good years coming up, but. It, you know, it does hurt in a single year to see a ten ten thousand dollar increase, thirty percent increase in in one year on that. So I think I'm gonna just throw this out there. Um, obviously I still have concerns about the sand and salt use um, as a whole. So I think what I've decided to do is this conversation where we're gonna have this spring at town meeting uh, focusing on climate change initiatives. I think I'm gonna maybe try to delve into that a little bit with the general public at town meeting and talk to them a little bit about my concerns about that and let them convey to me and the board what they're interested in doing, if anything at all. And if they choose to continue to not want to address the impacts of that, then you probably won't hear me ever talk about it again. Uh, but if I get an indication, or if we get an indication that they're interesting, interested in perhaps trying to somehow regulate it a little bit more um, and I think maybe the board should consider addressing a policy to uh, to try to deal with uh, the use of it uh, and I know it's a touchy touchy subject um, because the the major concern or the talking point is uh, safety so I get that. Right. And, you know, the, as much as I love town meeting, um, you're going to have 150 people there. Right. And, uh, anyway. I'm just thinking maybe it might give us some indication as to how they feel about it. Okay. How is that, yeah. how is that normally addressed on a town? Because a lot of the articles are based on 
monetary voting, what, how, do you, how does that typically work if you just want to talk about a subject or are you, I don't, I'm just trying to remember an example of something. How, do we, well, how would that be approached? In the only way that it can really be approached if you're going to have something done in this year's budget is that when, when the budget is talked about, you, you talk about it and then you, you know, if somebody wants to amend the budget to reduce the amount of salt, or you're looking to leave the budget alone for now and just get their sentiments and create a policy for going forward. Right. Okay. I mean, I'd prefer to do something about it this year, but is that brought up in, feel like my at the end of the meeting and the other, other, I just, I'm just trying to understand yeah, what other the, business, other you business, can't, you know, they can't bind you to anything, right. but that can advise, certainly can advise the select board that, okay. you know, you can take a stand next year on it. I mean, if this, if this can be part of the climate change discussion, which I think it should be, because it's impacting the quality of the water and the soils and oh, I think you're that you're talking about doing it in the article that correct change, correct that uh, Kathleen Day yeah. and those folks yeah, yeah I don't want to I don't want to wait to the end when everybody's uh, history I think that's a good spot for it yeah okay so, okay. so go is there anything all right on the highway budget otherwise it's really a, a maintenance budget it's like three 3.8%, 3 3.9% higher than last year. And took out the locust crop increase, be, you know, almost right on the money. Yeah, I'm always concerned about the increases in the pay line, you know, because that's never ending and it just seems to accumulate too quickly. Yeah. Okay. And then the only other budget that we hadn't looked at was the ARCS budget, which is on the page four, halfway through. And again, it's last year's the budget was ninety-four thousand five thirty. This year it's proposed at ninety-seven seven thirty. There's a few tweaks I can make throughout this general fund budget um, between now and next week. But uh, there's nothing different or new here either. So, any hard questions from anybody? Well, you're almost through another one, Bill. Appreciate your work. Almost. <laughs> and I wanted to, uh, again, commend you on that letter to the school board there. Oh, uh, I think it, I think it, I think it helped. Is, is it appropriate to ask, I, I am wondering just on that, I totally, I don't fully understand the email you, the scenario of the school board member not voting and then is that something we should just talk offline or should we talk in, can we talk in this? We can talk. Yeah, can you just explain a little bit there in terms of uh, the decision to basically non-vote and, um, explain your expectations and what we, I, mean, I guess it's just a little new to me to fully understand that process. Yeah, so um, I just reacted to what Caitlin wrote to me. Uh, you know, I sent the letter that you all signed and then the next day she sent me an email and said um, budget five passed and even though we didn't specifically say budget five, that was the one that you kind of you know, hope that they would gravitate to. And she said, and this was the results of the vote. And she listed everybody's name that voted aye and the ones that voted no. And then she just said, I as the chair abstained. So if you looked at it, the, it's weighted voting. Um, the water break votes were canceled. Is, so the thing passed like, you know, 50% to Pretty slim margin. 39% or something like that with an abstention. And, and I did the math, and if Caitlin had voted yes, it would have passed 60-40, basically. And if she had voted no, it still would have passed 50 and a half 
to 49 and a half or something mm -hmm. like that, because her vote is worth 9.85% of the total. So I just wrote to her, and it was from just a personal uh, observation from my point. I said, why don't you vote? I said, you know, you're not the lieutenant governor of the state or the vice president of the United States who by the Constitution is prohibited from voting unless there's a tie. You're one of my representatives and you didn't vote. So, you know, we're supposed to, Waterbury is supposed to have whatever the total comes to, about 34 percent of the delegates, the vote at, at uh, Harwood, sure. and she didn't vote. So I, I kind of called her on it, and I think I emailed everybody her response, which was, well, you know, um, Robert's Rules of Order says that, you know, there's rules for small boards and for large bodies. And a large body, it says that the chairperson typically doesn't vote unless their vote is going to change the outcome. It's not a tie, it's change the outcome. On a small board, Robert's Rules of Order says everybody should vote because there's only five of you or three of you, and if you didn't vote, it's hard sometimes to get business done. So she said, you know, I've decided for, for this board, given the contentiousness of this newly established unified board that as the chair it's easier if I don't vote unless my vote is going to change the outcome. So I felt a little better that uh, you know she's not just reserving her vote for if there's a tie. She would have voted if it meant it was going to flip from yes to no. But I still think for a board of you know 14 people that when you're you know, you're elected chair by your colleagues, you know, and why would anybody from Faceton ever agree to be the chair of the board if they're not going to, if they're going to be the chair of the board and they're going to be expected not to vote, that means Faceton doesn't have a vote. Right. So I think right. it's a little bit odd. Yeah, I tried to understand her point. Uh, obviously, from what we read and heard and understood that it is a divisive board and uh, uh, to try to manage that as any chair would be difficult let alone if you create animosity by showing your vote you know in, in favor of the town she represents I get, I get that you know uh, that's going to make it even more difficult to work with those other people later on so I understand that, but I also agree to your point as well. You know, she, my wife said, why is she a board member then? If she's not going to, if she got on there to represent us, then why didn't she represent us? Right. But it almost, it almost, if, if the, if the board is going to have that philosophy that the chair shouldn't vote, it almost means the Waterbury representative on the board has to be the chair. Because right. if you're from any of the other towns, yeah. you're going to give up Lose way such too a much if you don't percentage. ever vote. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so. yeah. But is it and are those vote. votes they go down the line and she's the last one to vote, or how does she know that her vote's not going to count? Yeah, I, I think she probably does some <clears throat> math beforehand, and you know says, well, if these, these set of people vote yes, so I'm, I'm you know. I, I didn't ask that, but I'm yeah. sure she's kind of got a strategy hmm. as to when she has to pull the trigger. So it's important for the public, especially in Waterbury and Duxbury, to pay attention to this whole school board process because uh, because of the vote, because of what it entails, uh, and because of the Valley's push to change either get that vote voted down or change things at the legislative level if that's even possible I can't imagine how it could be but uh, you know the resulting impacts of movement in what I would perceive as the wrong direction could cost the taxpayers a shit ton of money down the road uh, and I mean 
sooner than later, you know, not too distant future here. So it's important that the public stay on top of this effort by the school board because it could either not impact us as much as we'd hope it wouldn't or it could really impact us uh, depending on the, on the way the votes go so that's it Here. are we all set motion to adjourn now <laughs> you want to stay here another hour or so? Aye. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, Carla. Thanks for. Thanks for everything.